So welcome everybody. Nile is uh, one of the main maintainers of QGIS, um, which is, I've been told about mapping. So uh, I don't know if you use that software to find a way to this YouTube channel or big blue button, but in any case, over to you, Nile. Thanks. Yeah, so my name is Niall Dawson. Um, I'm from a company called North Road and I'm um, based in Australia, uh, based in a, a region of Australia called the Sunshine Coast. So if you kind of picture Australia about halfway up the eastern side of Australia, uh, that's pretty much where I'm located, almost exactly halfway up that uh, that that side and it's it's not called the sunshine coast by coincidence it is uh it's kind of a, a the beach area of australia so that's where i am at the moment though outside it's pitch black and uh i can't show you anything interesting outside at least um so like i said i my name is niall dawson i'm from a uh, consultancy called called north road um but more importantly for for today i am uh, also, a QGIS developer. Uh, I think the probably the biggest question you have straight off when I when I kind of introduce my my topic, I, I've I've given it the title here of uh, QGIS loves QT, uh, QT development experiences and advice from a massive open source desktop application. Uh, I, I kind of put that. That subtitle in for my my presentation. Um, and then I read back over it a bit, and I thought, well, actually, that it's a pretty good chance that that uh, subtitle would be misinterpreted. Um, and it sounds a little bit like we're you know we're big noting ourselves by saying we're a massive open source desktop application. I actually don't mean massive in terms of um, you know massive popularity or anything here. My my use of massive is in reference to the complexity of the software and the, um, the actual size of the code base. I'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, because like I said, probably you got a question first up uh, that's running through your brain of, you know, what, what is QGIS? Uh, that's, I think, the, the very first thing that we need to uh, clarify and just get get everybody sort of up to speed on exactly what this um, software package is. So QGIS, and I, I'll also alternate in my, my pronunciation here. So sometimes I'll call it QGIS, sometimes it's QGIS, whatever you want to call it, all works. But what's QGIS? Actually, before I can get to that question, I, I kind of need to back up a level um, because QGIS is a is a GIS application. So we need to really uh, clarify first off what a GIS is. Uh, formally, a GIS stands for a Geographic Information System. Uh, but informally, if anybody asks me what I do, uh, what you know, what the software I work on actually does, uh, the the easy way to explain it is to say it, it it's an application that lets you make maps. It's a, it works with maps. It works with spatial data. If you're looking at maps all day when you're using a GIS. But again, there's there's a little bit of clarification I need to do before we can really uh, understand exactly what's involved in a GIS and what all the different components and the different parts we've, we're sort of got in this software is. Um, because as soon as I say something like this, like a, it's a, a software application that lets you view maps, uh, I'm sure there's a, a big percentage of the audience who are, are thinking, well, you know, what, what's the point? Like, why do we need, uh, why do we need a specialist piece of software for, for uh, working with maps? When we've got, we've got a ton of these, um, of these applications and these libraries which uh, give give people or give the software the ability to show maps and to navigate them. So you might have come across ones like uh, there's, a, there's a fair few JavaScript libraries, so things like Leaflet or OpenLayers, uh, really well respected, really um, mature kind of first class open source libraries, JavaScript libraries for viewing and, and navigating maps. Uh, you might have also heard of things like uh, D3, again, JavaScript library, which lets you uh, embed a map on a on a website, or even I guess um, 
kind of more more close to today's discussion uh there's the the functionality in qt itself um, for like the the qml map class where you can uh, embed a map directly using this um this map qml type um so you you may have that question kind of bouncing around in the back of your brain of like what's the what's the point in a gis when we we already have all this other software that does that does maps i think the easiest way i can i can kind of uh clarify this situation is to say that we're actually uh, it's actually quite a different piece of software um, so conceptually, a piece of software like QGIS is is a very uh, distinct use cases, very different audience, very different sort of um, target users to something like uh, Leaflet or Open Layers or the the QML map type. Uh, maybe a good a good analogy here would be if we compared something like like the Blender application. Uh, to to VLC, so you know again both uh, extremely powerful software applications, but one of them is about content creation. So if we look at Blender, it's about actually making um, you know making videos, making those animations, versus uh, something like VLC where it's about it's a viewer and it's about um, sort of consuming that content. So that's that's really quite a, a similar distinction in the in the geospatial realm when you look at an application a full gis like qgis versus uh like a, a map viewer so something like leaflet or the, the qml map type uh but again exactly what is a gis if it's not just a map viewer what what's involved in a gis application Probably the easiest way to explain this is if we look at the actual uh, tasks that users do inside a GIS, because there's uh, there's quite a few very different tasks that all kind of combine into this one complex application that we, we call a GIS. So one of these, and probably the, the you know the first most important thing a GIS does is it lets you consume spatial data. So it's a uh, uh, the application has to be able to get data in from a huge range of different sources and web services and um, different formats and spatial databases and all this kind of stuff, uh, pull them in from anywhere that they sit and work with them all simultaneously. So there's a little bit of a distinction here from something if we considered uh, a mapping application like Google Earth, where it's basically, you know, Google Earth is kind of the application and that data packaged together, or something like, uh, you know, Google Maps or uh, or Apple Maps. They're they're like a the the viewer application and the data are sort of uh, intrinsically linked. A GIS is uh, quite distinct in that. Um, it doesn't come with data generally it's a it's made to work with data that you get from elsewhere so you get the data from your from your government from your client from a surveyor from uh remote sensing companies from maybe you uh from your, your uav where you've done your own uh photogrammetry but you're getting all this data from different sources you're pulling it all together to work with it spatially the next, uh, the next task that we have in a GIS that a GIS has to be able to do is actually let people create spatial data. So uh, a GIS has sort of CAD-like tools where you can go in there and actually draw these these objects on a map and say, well, you know, maybe my maybe my road uh, that I'm going to build will go this path, and I need to be able to get in there and actually draw that shape on my in my GIS. One of the other main tasks uh, that a GIS application needs to do is um, cartography. So this again, this might seem a little bit, um, I don't know, maybe antiquated to many people who kind of think, well, uh, isn't the time of static maps and printed maps dead? And uh, you know, everything's about interactive maps now. Um, the, the actual reality is that there's a, a huge demand still for static maps and for paper-based maps, uh, especially when you get into things like the you know the engineering fields and um, 
environmental studies and this kind of stuff where uh, a map will be used as like a subcomponent of a, of a wider report. So in my in my non-development day job in these kind of like rare little opportunities that I still get on a day-to-day -day basis to work with spatial data and make maps, most of that tends to be uh, me making maps for an engineer, for instance, uh, if they're doing something like they're proposing a new road corridor and they're writing up a big report about all the factors involved here, they'll include a, a whole series of maps, printed maps, static maps inside that report demonstrating different factors and different constraints they're sort of working with. So a GIS has to be able to make maps that look fantastic. That, that's sort of a, a core role it's got to be able to do. Uh, another piece of the puzzle is a, a GIS needs to be able to do data analysis. So again, with all these different data sets we've pulled in from different places, maybe remote sense data, maybe some from the government, um, we need to be able to actually do some analysis here and start doing things like calculating summary statistics and, and uh, maybe doing some classification of remotely sensed data uh, and start actually deriving new information from that spatial data. So that's again one of those really fundamental core tasks that a GIS needs to do. And the, the last one I've got here um, is a uh, GIS needs to be open for the users to automate these tasks because uh, a lot of GIS work or a lot of work with spatial data tends to be stuff that lends itself really well to end users automating the processes. Um, so maybe it's a, a process that gets repeated once a week. They get the, a new data set from their surveying team, for instance, and they've got a whole series of steps that they need to run this data through to get some maps in the out, in the uh, as an output, or they, they need to run it through all these steps, get some numerical summary statistics as an end, end, end product. Uh, but most GIS users tend to be uh, quite, well, actually, I'd, I'd probably go far as say, all GIS users tend to be um, really computer savvy, really quite uh, familiar with with automation in, in some regard and, and some sort of software development experience. So a GIS needs to be able to expose a whole lot of tools for these, these users to actually start uh, automating their processes that they do. So here we've got about five different, five different tasks that a GIS has to have and they're, they're very different from each other. So we've got things like the cartography task, where it's all about, you know, making maps look fantastic. So it's almost like a desktop publishing role or an illustration program role that we've got in there. And then we've got something like um, the data analysis step, where uh, it's almost like a whole statistical program that needs to be inside that that GIS. And in the same time, we've also got that um, that requirement that we can consume this spatial data from wherever it sits. So we've almost got like a database client, or we do, I mean, it's a, it's a database client, but we've, with uh, form functionality and, uh, you know, designer functionality, all this kind of stuff that has to be built into it. So this is kind of getting back to that original title that I gave this presentation of, of um, calling Q just a massive application because we've got so many different areas and so many kind of different uh, tasks that is included in the software package where really any of those individual tasks could easily be uh, a really complex application on its own. So you could have a, a you know a desktop publishing application where it's really complicated but that's all it does. Uh, QGIS has kind of got all that in there, but then it also has to have that data analysis. And that's, again, you know, that's almost like a, an application of itself. Now, the other, the other thing we've kind of got to keep in mind when we're, we're talking about a GIS, uh, a, a generic, a GIS as a sort of generic term, is that when we start to look at spatial data, there's some really special concepts that uh, are involved here. So some of these, just as a, a little cross section, uh, one of the one of these really special concepts that we've got 
that relates to a, a spatial data program like QGIS is this uh, idea of coordinate reference systems. So everybody or has probably been exposed to this to some degree. Uh, they've got some familiarity with these coordinate reference systems because we all we all understand that that concept of latitude and longitude um, of being able to locate a point on the earth with a with two numbers you know a latitude and a longitude in degrees um, this is uh, this can be equated a lot of the times to like a coordinate reference system of of wgs84 so wgs84 really common um, tends to be used as a default choice for people. Um, store, your, store your coordinates in WGS84, latitude and longitude, and that's the right choice. Um, unfortunately, when we're kind of talking about a, a specialized spatial application like QGIS or GIS, WGS84 is, is generally not a very good choice. And that's because uh, WGS84 is actually it, it's got an inherent ambiguity to it and it, it actually sort of that that one term WGS84 latitude and longitude encompasses like a whole range of different specifications and different um, reference frames so really if you get if you get a, a point location in WGS84 you get that latitude and longitude it doesn't matter how many decimal places you've been given to it, you can kind of at best treat that location with a you know, plus or minus 30 meter accuracy. So that can kind of be, you know, generally that's okay for some for some fields or for some applications, plus or minus 30 meters is not too bad. Um, but when we start talking about a dedicated application that's working with spatial data, this is, this is pretty poor because we're sometimes working on a millimeter level or a centimeter level. Um, another another kind of part to this coordinate reference system puzzle is this concept of map projections. So again, everybody has probably come across map projections in the form of this um, this Web Mercator term. So Web Mercator special map projection, which was originally developed for Google Maps right back in uh, you know the the kind of uh, early days of the internet. Um, and still used, like still used all over the place on the web today, all over the place on, on desktop and mobile today. Uh, so if you've ever used things like XYZ tiles, so stuff like the, you know, like an open, open street map tile server, for instance, uh, or even like a more modern, if you've come across vector tiles, like, a you know, the map box vector tile spec, that's all being delivered generally in that web Mercator, uh, projection. Um, the the thing about Web Mercator is again it, it tends to be a really bad choice for for spatial data when you're using a GIS application, and that's because Web Mercator has got some inbuilt trade-offs in it. So one of them is this uh, this thing you might have seen before, where if I go on Google Maps and I scroll up and have a look at Greenland, Greenland at the same zoom level is pretty much the same size as the whole of Africa. Um, so our Web Mercator projection, which is used again all over the web, uh, it's not what we would call an equal area projection. So basically saying that uh, as we look at that map of the earth, we can't tr compare different parts of the map, different countries or different regions and say this one is bigger than this one. It, it doesn't have that uh, nature in that projection. Um, the other thing that Web Mercator doesn't doesn't give us is this concept of being a, a conformal projection. So a conformal projection is a term that, that means that the map retains the same shape of objects, so the same shape of countries, or the same shape of islands or features. Uh, Web Mercator isn't even that. It's it actually slightly distorts them as well as making some big and some small. It also changes the shape of them. So Web Mercator is a good choice for for web mapping, um, and that's why it was originally developed. But it's actually a really poor choice if I'm making a map for, say, my my local government to be able to decide if a road should go for a certain 
uh, you know, certain land parcel. Um, so then we get in our in our kind of GIS spatial science realm this this concept of local projections, where they're basically specialized map projections for a little bit of the Earth's surface. And just to explain why we have this, you, you can kind of picture, uh, you know, in some in some in some fields, we could generalize the shape of the Earth as a sphere, and that would be fine. We could say, well, let's just treat it as a perfect circle. So when we're calculating distances and areas and bearings and things on the surface of this sphere, we'll just all treat it as a perfect sphere. Use the mathematical equations for that. But the reality is the Earth actually looks more like a kind of like a squashed a squashed sphere, uh, this special thing called an ellipsoid. So you can kind of imagine that uh, maybe, you know, someone stepped on the top of the Earth up at the North Pole and squashed it a bit down. That's a, that's a better approximation for the actual shape of the Earth. Um, but again, if, we, if we're looking at a GIS level where we've got this requirement for uh, really high accuracy, uh, this is actually a bit of a, a better representation of the Earth's surface. It's a big, jaggedy mess of uh, local variations and just, you know, it's, it's not a nice, perfect um, geometrical shape at all. So if we're, if we're doing calculations for things like areas and distances on the surface of the Earth, we, we could pick an approximation that gives us a good like overall fit for the whole Earth. So something like this, we could say, well, here's our wobbly geoid perfect representation of the Earth's uh, surface. We could generalize the whole of that with this particular blue ellipsoid, which gives a good sort of balance across the whole world. Or we could make a, a local one and we could say, well, here's the area we're actually interested in. Here's my here's my little bit of Australia that I live and that I'll be working with. And I could make a, a better approximation that that's much closer to just that bit. Not as good over here, obviously, and not as good for different parts of the world, but here it's a much better fit. So then we get into this kind of concept of, of local projections uh, and data, local datums, where if I'm working in a certain part of the of the world, a certain part of Australia or a certain part of Europe or a certain part of a country, I might have certain choices about how I actually need to set up my map and set up all that spatial data to make it so that the, the accuracy of my measurements matches the, the needs for the, um, the particular application I'm using. So like a horribly complex field, people go to university just to study geodesy and just to study these kind of concepts of spatial datums and spatial coordinate systems. Um, but it's it's something that actually becomes quite important when we're looking at the, the 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 requirements for a typical GIS user. Uh, something else that's quite quite unique, I guess, to to GIS is that GISs have to deal with a whole range again of um, of different data types. So we have things like we have these. Uh, concept of vector layers where a layer might have points and polygons and lines that that's probably easiest to relate to to people as like a geojson file it follows that model you also have ones like you can have raster layers or mesh layers or point clade layers and a whole bunch of different types of data that you've got to consume and they're all conceptually very different from each other again the um the accuracy requirement for a gis tends to be a lot more strict and a lot more stringent than a lot of other applications that work with maps and work with with um, kind of 3D data or spatial data. So it's actually not uncommon that you'll get this requirement that your data has to be down to like a millimeter accuracy. And when you're kind of comparing things, you have to be able to do it to a millimeter accuracy. Uh, and that's because if we're looking at spatial data, again, it's it's really common that maybe you're, you're working with a, a model of a city and here millimeter differences can actually be important when we're, we're talking about the location of buildings and with the location of assets and um, comparing those kind of things um, but ultimately what that means is that all these kind of shortcuts and trade-offs and optimizations that have been developed for computer graphics and for you know the the world of uh, video games and for 3d data uh, 
a lot of the time they can't be translated into this world of spatial data because we have this this need that we don't lose that accuracy and we have to be able to retain the original accuracy we can't kind of take little shortcuts and those nice um, optimizations that we would otherwise be able to do all right so that gives you a bit of background into what a, what a generic gis is if we come back again to our original question that we had at the start of the presentation about what what's QGIS, um, I guess in in answer to that, you could say QGIS is an open source GIS application. Um, QGIS started its life as a as an application called Quantum GIS. So this was back in two thousand and two. Uh, Quantum GIS was first launched, and Quantum GIS was started by uh, by this guy Gary Sherman. So Gary, when he started QGIS, he, if we have a look at the first release notes, so this is for version 0.0.1, right, right back in 2002. He basically made it for himself. He made a uh, this application, Quantum GIS, and he made it so that it could display spatial data which was stored in PostGIS. Uh, if you haven't come across PostGIS before, that's the that's a spatial extension which sits on top of the Postgres database that lets you store these geometry objects like points and polygons. Um, and his first version, that's all it did is it let you view this data. You you couldn't even navigate it, so you couldn't zoom into that data. You couldn't zoom out. You know, there's no interface to the visibility or symbology. You basically just it was a tool to to view that shapes that were stored in a PostGIS database. I uh, this is the earliest screenshot I could get. Yeah, QGIS. So this was Quantum GIS 0.7.4. Uh, still pretty minimal, I guess, in terms of its functionality that that's there. Uh, the map looks basic, but okay, I guess. Um, and it looks pretty old school in terms of uh, it, it looks like a, you know, it looks like a, an open source application looked back in that era where, where the icons are a bit funny, uh, kind of drawn by hand, I guess, in some circumstances. And the interface just in general is a bit hobby. Um, but one of the things that is interesting. So right back when Gary Sherman first made QJS as his own little project for himself to view this data, this is what he said. Uh, this is what he's said since that, sorry, um, in, in interviews where he's been discussing QJS. So Gary Sherman, QJS started as a solo effort in February 2002, driven by Gary's after hours desire to view post just data on his Linux box. So in his day job, he was working on this data and in his day job, he had tools in Windows to view it, but he, when he went home at night, he, he also wanted to be able to work on this data and his home computer was Linux and he, there wasn't any application to do that. So again, he, he had this need of being able to view his data in Linux and he made the choice at the time of, of basing this little application on Qt. Um, first off, he's got here because he had some previous experience with it, but uh, also because it worked on Linux. So um, that that initial cross-platform capabilities of Qt was what, what uh, drew him to start QGIS in it. Uh, so he's also said in this same interview when he was talking about his motivation, um, so he, he did choose Qt deliberately because it was cross-platform. So he had in the back of his mind, I'm, I'm writing this for myself, but you know maybe somebody else will have the desire to be able to run it on OS X or something like that. So um, that was one of his little uh, factors in his brain of, of, of choosing QT at the time. Um, I'm going to come back to this in a little bit because I I actually think that that Gary's decision to use QT is uh, is pr quite probably the major reason why QGIS is a success story that it is today. So I'm going to come back to that in a little bit. Um, but first, let's have a look at QGIS today. So QGIS today. A uh, little bit of summary of the project now. Um, so QGIS today is 
arguably the most popular open source desktop GIS application. Again, you could put a pretty strong argument in that it's it's the either the second most popular, possibly even the most popular GIS after uh, Esri ArcGIS. So that's a massive kind of proprietary GIS put out by a, a huge commercial uh, organization. Um, QGIS is translated into about 50 languages. It's available for Linux, Windows, Mac OS, and Android. Uh, we, we do a, a release every four months, and we have what's called like a long-term support release, which uh, is released every year and has uh, currently 12 months of, of bug fixes that we'll, we'll, we kind of pledge that we'll go back into that release. Um, and again, today, QGIS, you can get the, the QGIS, the, QGIS desktop application. Uh, there's also a server, so you can get QGIS server, um, and there's some mobile clients as well, which are based again on, on, on the QGIS code. A few little statistics about the project. Uh, we actually don't have any, any, good, any good stats about the number of users of QGIS. And that's because the software doesn't have any any kind of uh, phone home or um, any kind of reporting inside the the application. Uh, so at at best we can we can make rough guesses, but uh, the rough guesses as to the number of users could be we have no way of getting anywhere close to be honest, because um uh, you have all these kind of factors like the Linux distributions where people aren't getting them from the QGIS website. So we can't get the, the download stats and use the QGIS download stats as a, as a proxy for that. We also have, uh, by its nature, QGIS tends to be installed in a lot of large enterprises where you know a single download might actually end up on a thousand machines quite easily. So uh, who knows how many users, um, but the website visits are at least uh, yeah, we can we can count that, and that's around about seven hundred and fifty thousand visitors a month. So that gives some indication of the of the popularity of the project. Uh, in terms of development, there's uh, over over the years there's been uh, around about five hundred different code contributors to the project, um, and I make this this distinction for of code here. This is really important because you know QGIS is a is a big project, and there's a, a a whole lot of contributors who never touch a line of code, who are doing the translations, who are doing the documentation, the, the issue tri triaging, triaging, um, all that kind of stuff. But so that you know, today's today's presentation, we're focusing on developers because of the nature of the presentation. So, 500 code contributors over time. Um, again, depends on how you kind of measure it, but. We're, we're kind of floating somewhere between one and a half to two million lines of code uh, if you count various sort of auto-generated pieces of code or not, but round about one and a half million at the at a minimum. So again, pretty massive. It's a it's a big code base. Uh, I've got a question here actually in the um in the chat window about how how big is the currently active team? Uh, I would say there is uh, Again, depending on where you want to put that cutoff, between 30 to 50 active developers who are regularly contributing to the project. Um, and there's there's a team of, uh, I'd say, around about 10 who are contributing on a daily basis from, from different places. Uh, if you look at the, you know, the GitHub sort of contribution activity, you can see it's nice and healthy. So um, I think it was about about here where it actually moved to github before that it was in svn or something um but the the development has has uh had a sort of general increase around about here but since then the the activity has been static so that's fine i mean so that's like a nice sign of a healthy project uh we also have around about um, 30 organizations now who offer commercial support. So these are, these organizations are, are basically consultancies who are offering training and services around QGIS, but these are also the people who are 
the predominant developers of QGIS today. So there's around about 30 of them scattered all throughout the world. If we if we look at um, if we're talking about the QGIS uh, ecosystem, we also have to talk about the the project itself because there is a, a formal organisation QGIS.org, which is a uh, a Swiss I, I, I'm not sure the actual term, but effectively like a not-for-profit organization that basically sits and does the governance of the QGIS project. So that's outside of the code contributors and the etc. There's a, a separate team of elected uh, elected board and the, the project steering committee who sit there and basically govern the project and direct that. Um, one other thing that the this QGIS.org not-for-profit organization does is they they handle um, donations and sponsorship for the project so currently uh, on an annual basis the qjs.org project has a, a, a yearly budget of around about 200,000 euros um, and you can see here this is a little bit out of date but it's there it's sort of about 70 percent 65 percent comes from direct sponsors to the project so that's that tends to be a uh, organizations who will um, join in a put in a pledge basically to support QGIS for a certain amount per year um, whenever somebody downloads QGIS on the QGIS.org website they get prompted while the downloads going to say hey have you considered clicking this button and donating a couple of euros or a couple of dollars to the project that ends up totaling to about 25 percent of the yearly budget for the for QGIS.org um, and then there's a few other smaller income sources that, that the project has. Uh, and if we look at where that money actually goes, um, we've got, uh, these numbers are a bit hard to read in the slide, sorry, but it's around about 50% of those, of that, that yearly budget gets pushed back to the developers. So every time QGIS is coming up for a new release, um, the, that governing body, the, the PSC, uh, basically contracts different developers who are regular contributors to the to the application and says look I'm going to pay you for a week or two weeks of your time to sit down there and just get the bug track the bug queue as best shape as possible prior to release so that's around about 50% of that of that yearly budget goes on that uh, pre-release bug sprints um, we QGIS.org also has this thing they call the, the grants program. So this is where developers so um, can can basically approach the PSC, the QGIS.org, and ask for funding to to do tasks that are not going to be able to get funded elsewhere. So this is things like um, if if a developer like myself sees an area of code and we're like this. This needs reworking. It's fragile. It's you know it's poorly written, or it's a it's going to fall apart. It's got no unit tests. Um, that's almost impossible for somebody to say, let me let me approach the end users or the end uh, enterprise users of QGIS and say, can I get funding from you to refactor these piece of code? Uh, you, it's almost impossible to sell but fortunately that that QGIS.org grant program has gives a way of, of people saying. All this unglamorous behind the scenes work um, that still needs to be done, there, there's funds available to, to do that. Um, and as well as that, there's also the infrastructure costs here of like actually running the website and, and all the servers and the CI and all this kind of stuff as well is a big part of that yearly budget. Um, as far as the actual funding for, for QGIS development, Outside of that grant program, most of the the major development that happens in QGIS today tends to be directly funded by end users. Five minutes. Great. Uh, I've got to speed up a little bit. Um, but one thing that we do a lot of is we do a lot of uh, crowdfunding. So uh, many features have been put into QGIS as a direct result of these crowdfunding efforts where, where a developer will say, like this, we've got one going on now for point cloud data support. Basically, a bunch of us developers have said, we want to be able to put this in QGIS. Um, can people pay us to do it, if, you, if you're interested in seeing that? Right. Uh, 
the last part of my presentation, I'd like to just dig in a few little bits of the QDIS code and just talk about how we actually use QT and, and our experiences there. So QDIS and QT, we're, QT is used all throughout QDIS on, on all levels. So even at the most lowest level of the QDIS code, we see QT everywhere throughout this. So something like this, like this is our, our point class. So it's the, the representation of, you know, this, the, the most fundamental object in a, in a geospatial system, like a, a point. Um, it's got QT everywhere. It, we, we basically use QT right down to the very, very smallest level of, of QGIS. Um, and I've got here, I, I like I mentioned before, I think that Gary's decision right back in the early days of basing QGIS on, on QT was what gave QGIS an early advantage. This is in my opinion. I don't have any kind of uh, formal justification for this, but in my experience, this is what I reckon it is. So first off, Gary's decision to put it in QT meant that there was uh, an ease of coding for developers. So the, the QT framework, it's much more accessible to people than pure C++. So this meant that in the early days of QGIS, when it was branching from being his little hobby project for his own needs, uh, it was easier for it to attract additional contributors. And those people as well were hobby developers. So they weren't professional C++ gurus. Um, they were people who were spatial and analysts, had a bit of development experience, but just wanted to to focus on the actual spatial tasks, not on the uh, C++ code. And QT's uh, accessibility meant that it was easier for those people to jump in and start contributing. Um, again, the, the cross-platform nature of it uh, was one of those the great consequences of Gary's decision. I've got a thing here as well. I, I actually attribute some of QGIS's early success to this wonderful class called QPainter. I'll explain why in just a second. Uh, but aside from that, so QGIS today makes really heavy use of QT Core, QT GUI, and QT widgets. Um, they're, the, they're kind of three fundamental parts of the QT framework that we use all throughout QGIS. Um, I've mentioned that QPainter. So, if I looked at the, the QGIS map renderer, so the bit that actually draws the maps, this is all built almost entirely on QPainter. And this is a bit funny. So when, when I was asked to, to do this presentation um, about, you know, how, how does Q just use QT and, and what's our experiences, uh, I'm almost a little bit embarrassed to say that for us, you know, QPainter is actually one of the best bits of QT because QPainter is it's pretty old, it's not that exciting, it's been around forever, um, but QPainter is, is the fundamental part of the, the QGIS map renderer. Um, so if I look at like the, the code for drawing a polygon, for instance, it's just painter operations. All this is is calling QPainter stuff to inbuilt QT API to draw a path. Um, And the, the benefit of this is that the QPainter gave us, in those really early days, heaps of ready-to-use drawing tools, um, but it also gave us almost for free the, the ability to export maps to PDF, to images, to SVG, to directly print them, um, all using the same piece of code. So all using that QPainter code, we just got all this functionality that was really nice to have in a GIS um, that satisfied those people who had strong cartographic requirements. Um, all of a sudden, we could make really nice looking maps just by calling that that raw underlying QT QPainters existing classes. Um, the other really nice thing about QPainter is because it it's vector based. Um, if you're doing like the draw line, draw point operations. Um, it means that you can take the maps that you make in QGIS and export them to something like Adobe Illustrator or Inkscape for, for further post-production. And you get really high quality outputs because it's still vector. They're, they're basically lossless. You can zoom in infinitely and, and tweak those things. Um, so a lot of what QGIS map renderer or map symbology actually is, is just 
getting bits of QPainter functionality um, and exposing that to the user. So all this stuff, if I'm looking at how we actually style lines in QJS, this is just raw QPainter API that's been exposed to users. You know, they, they get the choice of join styles, of, of cap styles, of custom dash patterns. None of that we've had to implement in QGIS itself. We just call out directly to, to QT. Um, and as a, a good example of this, it, it basically meant that even in those really early days, right back sort of in Gary Sherman's first versions, uh, the maps made by QGIS already looked great. Like they, they already had really high quality outputs and it was really usable as a, as a nice cart cartographic tool. Um, so personally, like this, this was one of my first contributions to QGIS. So this is back in 2013 when I was first just an end user with a bit of software development experience starting to get involved in the project. One of my first uh, pull requests to the project was um, basically allowing QGIS so you could set the composition modes or the blending modes for, for map layers as, you, as you're rendering them. People love this. Like I, I really wanted it in my for my own maps, but there was like a really hit a niche uh, a sweet spot in terms of oh, so many map, so many GIS people wanted to see this this functionality, but the the kind of a nice thing was when when you actually look at that original pull request I did to the QGIS code base, it was only really one line. It, there was a bunch of, of uh, GUI work to expose a choice to a user, but the guts of it was really just this single change, this single one line of code of saying. I'm just going to call the Q Painter set composition mode API, and that's it. And now I've got blend modes or composition modes available in my GIS. The funny thing is, this was back in 2013, and it's only in the releases this year in 2020 that we're starting to see the the commercial alternatives to QGIS uh, expose blend modes or composition modes. So. We got this really early win right back in 2013 by calling that Q Painter one line of code, exposing it to users, letting them make that choice, and we got this this awesome win that, that drew a lot of users and a lot of attention to QGIS. Uh, have I got? Can I have four more minutes before we go into questions? Okay, four more minutes then. Four more minutes, great. Thank you. Uh, I'll skip over a little bit here because I'd like to just talk about um, one. I've talked about a nice early ancient piece of QT, that Q Painter class that's been around for forever. I'd like to talk about QT 3D because this is something that we we use in QGIS now as well. So QT 3D. When this was announced, we thought, great, you know, this this sounds like it's going to be something that'll be really useful. We'll be able to take that ease of use of of the QT libraries um, and expose a, a 3D view of our of our maps to um to our users. And so we did that. So we've uh, if you download your new QGIS release, you'll see that you've got an option of having a, a 2D map window like this from that top down view, but you can also have a 3D view of your data, and you can see it in using this QT 3D uh, framework. Um, and that's been one of the, the focus areas of QGIS over the last maybe two years of, of extending this 3D functionality, adding in more and more features to this, adding in more, uh, improving the rendering quality and that sort of stuff, and the, the navigation of the 3D views and that sort of stuff. Um, we've had a, a Google Summer of Code student actually over the last couple of months who's been doing some really nice enhancements to it. So doing things like adding shadow support for, the, for that 3D view of your maps. Uh, and so what we found was that QT 3D is is fantastic, but we we kind of went into this project thinking that it would be a uh, um, a similar experience as our Q Painter experience of basically just we can make an awesome map renderer by exposing all the existing stuff that's in Q Painter to users, letting them make that choice of, of blend mode or of uh, line cap style um, and they get awesome maps that way. It's been quite different with QT 3D um, and we, we have two real pain points with this. So there are two pain points that we've hit with, with QT 3D. It's first off uh, the QT 3D documentation. Um, I say this, I, I don't want this to be like a negative to um, 
to the QT 3D developers, but I'd actually like to flip it and say, I think our, our pain points with the QT 3D documentation is that we're so used to the, uh, I'd, I'd have to say it's like exceptional quality of the, the standard QT documents, documentation where you get so much description of those classes, you know, so much uh, in-depth information in that, that API documentation that going to the the newer QT 3D classes, it's really tricky to actually, uh, you know, there, there's no comparison. To them. So I'm, I'm hoping this builds up over time and that this is something that will be um, expanded out. So in the future, these these 3D docs will be just as nice as the, the older classes. Um, the other pain point that we've really had with QT 3D is it, it feels like we're, we're really kind of going it alone in many ways because there's not a lot of examples out there. So, you know, Q, Q Painter, you can find a billion examples. You can find a billion answers on, on Stack Overflow and stuff. When you have a question, you can find that. QT 3D, at the moment, it's it's really kind of digging in and you're, you're sort of finding your own way around with a flashlight. Uh, and you can find other people who've asked the same questions, but nobody's actually got that expertise or those answers yet. So again, I think this is something that's going to be fixed over time, but at, as it is right now, this is our probably our biggest pain point with, um, with the QT library. Uh, one last little point that I'd like to make before I wrap up this talk is that if I'm, if I'm talking about QJS, I have to be honest and I have to talk about our relationship with upstream in upstream in this case being QT. And the, the sad truth is that we don't have any relationship really. Um, QJS historically, the, the tradition has just been, let's just hack everything in downstream. If we've got a bug that we're hitting in the upstream libraries like QT, well, we'll just find some workaround in QGIS itself that gets us past that. We've got a couple of reasons for that. One is uh, we've got some licensing issues. So QGIS is, is pure GPL. We don't have like a, a dual clause or anything like this so that we can, so that can sometimes uh, hamper us from pushing code back upstream. Um, we also have, this is the biggest one really, is this, this issue of packaging and distribution. So if there's a bug in QT, for instance, and we get that fixed upstream, there's a massive lag before our end users actually get this bug fix. So if it's like a Linux distribution they're running, it might be 12 months, it might be 24 months before we can actually rely on that bug fix being available to a user because you know, the distributions update QT on their own whim. Um, even the QJS Windows build, which is more or less our own choice and our own responsibility, it's stuck on QT 5.11. So it's not even a modern version of QT, it's still lagging. So we've got this real pain point of, we need a fix, we need it now, we have to do it. We have to do it in QJS rather than doing it in those libraries. Um, the, the nice thing is on, there's been improvements recently in that in that aspect. Um, and so one thing that you'll see is if you uh, look at the QGIS budget, that QGIS.org yearly budget, there's actually a big slice of the pie now for upstream fixes. Um, and we've, we've done things like uh, contract out some bug fixes to KDAB so that they could get them into QT and they could navigate all those issues about um, the code base and that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, so hopefully in 12 months time, it'll be a different story. Thank you, uh, I'm done now. So if you've got questions, <laughs> um, <laughs> I've left a little bit of time. You, you are like a, like a typical uh, uh, engineer doing a presentation. It'll take at most 40 minutes and then here 55 <laughs> minutes later. <laughs> That's okay. I, I, first of all, I was shocked to learn that you claim that the earth is not flat, but we can take that another time. <laughs> Actually, um, Q just does let you do calculations, assuming that the Earth is flat. And sometimes that's a valid choice to make. You can get away <laughs> with a Cartesian-based calculation. And yeah. Right. So that's your we, choice. Got a, we got a few questions here. Uh, there's a guy asking, can you demonstrate a working and modern QGIS-based app? Or can you uh, at least point him in a direction of something that's, that's a good example? Well, 
what I would suggest is actually just going here, QGIS.org, downloading the QGIS desktop application, um, and you will get you'll get it. <laughs> uh, but otherwise, there's there's a uh, if you want to see it in action and you don't have any data to work with, the what I'd suggest is going to YouTube, doing a search for for QGIS uh, demo or QGIS uh, screencast, and you'll see a lot of people do live training or live um, demos of the software. And mm -hmm. it, it's actually been a, a funny thing since the whole uh, you know COVID lockdown thing is there's a, a stack load of people who uh, are just pressing record, screencasting their day-to-day -day jobs of, of doing <laughs> things like using QGIS. So you can go on there and there's videos where you can just watch someone use it for an hour and they'll sort of talk through their thing of like, now I know what I want to do is this and I'm going to try this and you know oh, that didn't work, it doesn't look so good, maybe I'll back out and I'll try it in this way. Um, so if you really want to get a feel, you could actually just sort of sit behind someone virtually doing that. And I've got to admit, I actually, I, I did a... Um, I did one myself. I did a live queue, just bug fix, and I just screencasted it. It's had 20 views or something on YouTube, so there you go. <laughs> I guess it's an advantage that you can speed up queue, uh, speed up playback in YouTube. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just 20 minutes. <laughs> well, I'm surprised that somebody, uh, some 20 people, have watched it for, for it took an hour and a half to fix that bug. <laughs> They've watched it. So, well, that's another question here. So. Uh, you are, you've been around for quite a quite a while. So the question goes to uh, how did the Qt4 to Qt5 migration uh, affect you, and what's your expectation for the Qt5 to Qt6? Yeah, that's uh, a, that's what? a great question. So Qt4 to Qt uh, Qt4 to Qt5, that was a real big pain point for QGIS um, because QGIS makes this stable API pledge. Um, we have Python bindings, and we have a whole plugin sort of ecosystem. Uh, of people who submit Python-based plugins to QGIS. And the, the pledge is for QGIS version 2, that API is going, that the code that worked in QGIS 2.0 is going to work in QGIS 2.14. Um, so when it was time for Qt4 to Qt5, uh, we we basically have to, to break that that API pledge, which means that we we got a bump to a major version to QGIS three. So, uh, at the same time, we had things like the Python two to Python three transition, and there was also um, the the PyQt four to PyQt five transition. So we had these kind of three big major bumps of these underlying libraries that we had to do, and we had to upgrade all the code to, to get it to this. It took about three years, I think, from when we first started making QGIS QT5 compatible to actually QGIS 3.0, which was our big API breaking release that brought in Qt5 and Python 3 and that. Um, uh, and it, it, was, it was difficult because we were juggling all these different things, but we were also juggling at the same time a real transition period for the project itself. So this kind of period was at a time where we really saw the development in QJS shift from, from sort of volunteer development, from hobbyist end users who also were putting in fixes to specialized QGIS commercial supporters um, where professional developers were actually doing the de development and um, now you look at QGIS today and it's kind of 95%, 98% is those professional developers and those commercial um, support organisations who are doing the development. It's maybe like 2% sort of volunteer. So it, it was a really trying time for the project because we were juggling all these big things at the same time. In terms of Qt5 to Qt6, we, we've discussed this and we've decided it's too early for QGIS itself to break our own API. So we're not ready to, to jump to QGIS 4 and break all those plugins and those user scripts and stuff yet. So what we, uh, at the current, um, right now, what we're thinking is the Qt5 to Qt6 transition is a lot nicer. It's a lot gentler for us than Qt4 to Qt5. So we would like to do like a soft break and say QJS 3.18 can be built on Qt6, um, but it 
we will keep the QT5 compatibility all the way up to some period in maybe 24 months when we're ready to say it's time for QGIS 4.0. That's our current thing. We've got it up to about a stage where we can we can build on Q5.14 without any of the deprecation warnings. So we're getting close to a Q6 compatible build. Got a little bit of work to do still, but we're we, you know, it's it's achievable. Interesting. So one last question here: data on on maps. That sounds like massive amount of data that you're you're accessing there. How how are you accessing that? Is that through through Qt API or or do you access the database directly or? Um, so QGIS itself has got uh, well, about a dozen different backend data providers. So one that is used a lot of the, is one of the most popular ones, I guess, is there is a, a library called GDAL. So the geospatial data abstraction library. And that's a library that lets QGIS read in all these different spatial data formats like uh, like GeoJSON or shapefiles or geo packages or geo tiffs and the ECWs and all these other formats. They come from that that library. So we have a, a data provider that sort of talks natively to GDAL um, and that's not really cute classes, I guess. But we also have data providers for things like SQL Server. So SQL Server, Microsoft SQL Server can have spatial objects in there. And we have a SQL Server data provider which uses the the QT SQL database classes to mm -hmm. communicate with that. So there's a there's a range. There uh, we also have um there's a bunch of web based standards. So things like a uh, WMS you might have heard of or WFS or um yeah they're probably the two main ones. So they're kind of network based things. And for those we use the QT network classes to actually communicate with those services. Okay, cool. Well, Niall, thank you very much for staying up. Uh, until 11 o'clock in the evening, uh, sleep well. Thanks very much. Thank you very much.